Remember when anime was unpopular? I mean, kids weren't getting shoved into lockers over it, but you didn't really talk about it either. But now we have actual celebrities just talking about what their favorite anime is. Does Samuel L. Jackson like anime? Yes, I do. Hentai too. <laughs> so the question is, how did we get here? How did anime become mainstream in the West? Now anime has had some kind of relationship with Western media for a long time. Anime movies have been shown in American theaters since the 60s, with these releases being from stuff made by Toei Productions to Pokemon movies to anything Studio Ghibli just put out. And then there's the infamous live-action remakes that the US just generally can't seem to get right. They've been doing that since the 90s. Did you know that in 95 there was a Fist of the North Star movie? And yeah, it's obviously not very good. <laughs> then you have the standout laughing stocks of Dragon Ball Evolution and Death Note. <laughs> This is the most obnoxious thing I've ever experienced in my life. Granted, some have gotten their fair share of praise, like Alita Battle Angel. That doesn't really matter, though, because this is not where the future of anime's relationship with Hollywood lies. We may get an Alita Battle Angel every now and then, and US theaters can keep airing big anime movies. I'll be there. But the future of any art form, movies included, isn't just showing what other people are doing with it. It's in learning and adapting, and that is exactly what we're starting to see. This isn't an entirely new thing, I mean you have stuff like The Matrix and Pacific Rim, but it's definitely starting to get a lot more popular and a lot more prevalent. The two biggest examples in recent times are Puss in Boots 2, The Last Wish, and Creed 3. Now, what do these movies have in common? Well, they both have their directors coming out and directly talking about the anime influence that led to how these movies were made. In the case of Creed 3, Michael B. Jordan is the lead actor and director of the movie, giving him a lot of creative control over the project. And given that it's the first movie he has directed, you can definitely feel a difference between it and the rest of the franchise. It's because it's the, the ninth movie over the sagas, you know, you think it's, I had to lean on my, uh, my love of uh, Japanese animation and the themes of that to kind of make this one creatively and visually look different. I mean, just watching the fights, you can see the anime inspiration. The way the slow motion is done, the way the planning is implemented in the fights, it's all very anime and that has been no secret whatsoever. You also see some of this inspiration, like I said, in the second Puss in Boots movie. The movie's director, Joel Crawford, goes out of his way to mention the influence that anime has had on his work here, saying, I've always loved anime. I remember watching Akira and that just blew my mind as a kid, so being able to use some of those sensibilities to convey this larger-than-life action hero is just awesome. He only name-drops Akira, but he's a guy who's been a fan of anime anime for quite a while and wanted to express that in his sense of how it portrays action, going on to say that when Puss is fighting a giant at the beginning, he looks like he's been dropped into a fairy tale painting, with the action animated in a style that leans toward anime. But what does that mean? Because anyone can see a cool action scene and go, whoa, that's so anime. But cool action isn't what defines anime. It's true that generally speaking, when people think of anime, they think of shonen battle anime, and when they think of those, they think of the incredible action set pieces that anime puts out on a regular basis. But that is a small fraction of what anime offers, so what does it mean to be inspired by anime? In the case of Puss in Boots, this has informed how the animation is done, with him saying, the animation style goes from traditional CG to stepped animation, which you might compare to anime, which feels fantastical and pushed. To really simplify it, stepped animation is when you don't have interpolation between frames, so it goes from one keyframe to the next with nothing in between, which achieves the the result we see in Puss in Boots 2. But again, this isn't really an answer. For one, that's meaningless to a live action movie. Now what defines anime is something a bit more stylistic. I'm looking at anime every day, so that's in my thing. I just want to get other people on the same page to kind of connect. So just don't take it literal, but just the essence of what we're trying to pull from this is what we're going to try to capture in certain areas of the boxing matches. So In this interview, Michael B. Jordan feels compelled to warn general audiences that what they 
they are going to see is not entirely literal. And he is absolutely correct to feel that way. There's a scene in Creed 3 where he and Damien, the antagonist of the movie, are having their final fight. It's the second round, and suddenly, the people watching the fight disappear. And it becomes a bit abstract, with the bars coming down behind Adonis. It's not literal, but it does have a lot to do with Adonis and Damien's shared backstory, and conveys the emotions behind the fight well. So usually in anime, when the protagonist and antagonist are fighting, Physically, they're trying to take each other's heads off. They're trying to kill each other. They're trying to, you know, they're trying to, you know, trying to win the physical battle. But emotionally, you know, they're usually someplace quiet. And they're talking about how they feel because fighting was the only way they can communicate with one another. The reason I bring this scene up is when I watched this movie in theaters and it happened, there was a very particular feeling in the audience because you could kind of tell who got it and who didn't. That isn't to say that the people who didn't quite get it right away are dumb, they just probably weren't used to it. Because it's not like the scene is subtle, quite the opposite. Anime's strong suit is not subtlety. It's this stylization that isn't always literal or normal. That's what makes people see something and go, that was so anime. It's not so easy to define, but anime has this big tendency to convey the emotions in big, visually stylized moments. It uses the fact that it's animated to not be totally literal about it, to express the feeling of the scene rather than what is physically taking place. A good example is a recent big hit of an anime called Blue Lock. It's about soccer. I haven't watched it personally, but I have friends who won't shut up about it, and whenever I see a scene because of them or because YouTube recommends it, I gotta say, these dudes just aren't playing soccer. But that's kind of the beauty of it. Things like Blue Lock can take soccer and bring it to a level that's absurd. But it's really about taking the mundane and making it a more visceral experience, and that's really all there is to it. Animation has always had the incredible opportunity of pushing the boundaries of what you can show because it's not bound by physical limits, and anime has done a lot with this idea. That's not to say it's exclusive to anime, I mean western animation has always been rather expressive itself, but you definitely see the anime influence in these works. Sometimes it is the cool imagery that pushes past what's literally happening, and sometimes it's just a cool aesthetic to draw from. And I've made this video mostly about Puss in Boots 2 and Creed 3 because those are standout examples by directors who are vocal fans of anime, but that's not the end of it, and it's not just in Hollywood. It's been in Western cartoons as well for quite some time, notably the entire aesthetic of Avatar The Last Airbender and the stylization that Teen Titans tended to use. I mean, Teen Titans had a separate opening that was in Japanese, it doesn't get more blatant than that. This trend has continued in Western animation to recent times, such as in shows like Amphibia where the main character basically goes Super Saiyan Blue. This sort of inspiration even translates to little references, like in the teaser trailer for the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie, Donatello seems to have a sticker of Gojo from Jujutsu Kaisen on his staff. Also, there was this rumor going around that started on a Twitter post that in Across the Spider-Verse, there is a scene involving Miles owning a mint condition figure of Deku from My Hero Academia. There isn't any confirmation on that being an actual thing as far as I know, but that's pretty cool if it's real. And this kind of stuff happens because the people who make this stuff just love anime. The people who grew up with it are no longer kids, they are some of the people actually making movies and shows now and get to express that love. There's really no secret to it, this is just how art evolves as new sources of it are introduced. And it makes me really excited as a fan of anime because it means we're only going to see more stuff like this. Not the soulless live action remakes, but new stories that care the heart of anime with them. And when you get down to it, that's just really cool. Anyway, that's the video. If you liked it, do be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. If you want to support the channel, feel free to become a member and get some exclusive perks, including having your name at the beginning of every video, like our first member here. But in the meantime, take care and have a good one.